Before we begin the, uh, the second session and the new panel, I did want to uh, make up for an oversight earlier in our program. We, we had uh, uh, thanks to all of our sponsors. You see them listed there in the, in the handout materials. Unfortunately, uh, we did omit one of those sponsors and it was probably arguably one of the most important uh, of all. Uh, we were concerned about where to go and originally when we picked this venue, there was concern that we wouldn't uh, fill the room. It turned out we more than filled the room and we have an overflow room, as you know, in the, uh, in the adjoining space. But uh, the director of the, of the Nashville Downtown Public Library is Kent Oliver, who's standing right over to my right. And he was instrumental, along with Saul Solomon of the Metro Legal Department, in getting us this facility at uh, no cost. And I, I think we ought to thank him for that. Yeah, that it serves as a, as a model, we think, for, for CLE of this type with, that, that is available to members without cost when we have great sponsors like the Federal Library Fund, like the Metro Legal Department and the, and the library itself and the other sponsors that you saw listed on your materials there. Bef before uh, introducing the next panel, I want the, uh, the video guru, Mr. Jody Bailey, to uh, cue up a video from uh, Mr. Hooker that I think will, will supply you with the information that John McLemore was, was uh, teasing us with. But Jody, before we do that, I'm almost uh, violating my own agenda here. I'm gonna invite someone up to the stage. Dave, if you're still here, we haven't uh, lost you. Dave Baker, who is an assistant federal public defender, you notice has a rather interesting last name and I thought it would be uh, good for you to hear from him directly as to how he is related to this case. And by the way, I have a relation as well. I noticed when we first saw the docket sheet from federal court back in uh, 1959 that uh, my mother's first cousin, Ellis K. Meacham, who was city attorney for Chattanooga at the time, was also counsel for the city of Chattanooga in Baker versus Carr. So I have a little bit of a connection myself. But Dave, come on up here and, and tell us uh, who you are and how you fit in here and show us something that you brought with you. Thank you, Ed. My name is David Baker. I am a lawyer with the Federal Public Defender's Office, and I've had the honor of having a few cases with Mr. Yarborough back when he was our U.S. Attorney. Um, my grandfather was Charles Baker, who was the first listed plaintiff in the lawsuit, and the reason for that, he was the chairman of the Shelby County Quarterly Court, which was the essentially an executive and legislative body that governed Shelby County. He was, would be the equivalent of what would now be the county mayor in Shelby County. And um, I remember him talking to me about the case when I was a kid. Um, his position was he couldn't understand why the state Supreme Court wouldn't enforce the Constitution. As far as he was concerned, he would say to me, David, it seemed like it was just plain as day that they ought to follow the state Constitution. And he was quite puzzled why the case had to go to the federal court uh, the way it did. Um, he would be very proud of this gathering here today, and I appreciate the Nashville Bar Association uh, having this program. When the decision came down in 1962, um, the, the congressman that represented the area where my grandfather lived was Cliff Davis. He was a Democratic congressman in West Tennessee, and he had a copy of the opinion bound in this black binder and given to my grandfather. And so when um, I graduated from law school just a few years ago at Vanderbilt, um, back in 1990. My grandfather gave me this bound copy and he wrote inside to David Baker, my grandson, hope one day you will win a case in the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> I haven't even been anywhere near there. <laughs> well, uh, really the derivative of my father in the sense that uh, I was my father's son, and he and Jack Norman were great friends. They were two leading lawyers of their time here in, in certain minds of many, including me. And, and Frank Clement uh, employed Jack Norman to investigate a judge whose name was Ralston Schoolfield, who allegedly taken some bribes from the labor movement. And the McClellan Committee had investigated the labor movement, and they got onto that, and they uh, had, had uh, asked this judge, Schoolfield, to come testify before the McClellan Committee, and he declined. 
and uh, Governor Clement found out about it and infuriated him that a judge would not honor the United States government by uh, offering to testify about a matter that they claimed that he knew something about. And so Clement decided he would in, uh, employ Jack Norman to investigate the question of whether or not uh, this Judge Ralston Schoolfield had in fact taken bribes. And Mr. Norman uh, uh, came over to my office, and uh, uh, who I was a uh, underling uh, in my father's office, and said, uh, "I want you to be my assistant." And uh, I thought, mm, "He knows I'm a man of great talent. You know, I mean, why, how he's picked me out here among all these lawyers to be his assistant." Uh, but then it, it, it dawned on me that the real truth is that he wanted to keep my father from representing Schoolfield, and and that's uh, that's the reason he's got me in as his assistant. My father had gone to school with Schoolfield, a new Schoolfield, and sure as God made green apples, Schoolfield was going to get him as his dependent lawyer, and Norman recognized that, so he took me in the case. And so we go over there and, pro and uh, investigate uh, Schoolfield, and came back and, and presented to the Senate, to the House. The House impeaches him, and they employ Norman and me to represent him in the Senate to pro prosecute uh, Schoolfield, and we did. And Bobby came down and testified. And before uh, uh, in that trial, the school field impeachment trial. And after he got through testifying that day, uh, I tr uh, he asked me to take him to the airport and, uh, via uh, the Hermitage. So he wanted to see Andrew Jackson's house. So we went out to see Andrew Jackson's house. And uh, he spent both a couple hours there. And he, he was so fascinated with it that he got the lady to agree to stay open for another 30 minutes to, to, so he could see it. And I really knew nothing about Senator Kennedy. I didn't know anything about Bobby. And, and we leave the, the uh, mansion. And I'm walking to the car, and I say to him, uh, tell me more about yourself. And I said, do you have any, uh, I know about Senator Kennedy. Do you have any brothers and sisters? He said, oh, yeah, I got a lot of brothers and sisters. I said, well, who, where are they? And he said, well, there's Joe. And uh, I said, what does he do? And he said, uh, He's in heaven. And uh, it shook me because it was a, the way he said it was just so powerful. He's in, he's in heaven. It's like it was, a, it was a fact, you know. It wasn't the fact. I said, well, uh, who else? And he said, this Kathleen. She was second. I said, where is she? He said, uh, she's in heaven too. And he goes down the list and tells me about his brothers and sisters. And... Uh, we take him to the airport, get to the airport, and we miss the damn plane, and which was uh, good news for me, because I was going to get to take him to Dunn and spend an evening with him, and did, and that began a friendship that stayed in existence to the to the instant he died, and every minute since, I loved Bobby Kennedy. All right. Once again, we see that the activities of lawyers beyond their offices and their billable hours can make a huge difference in their careers and even in the course of history. Because as you'll hear in a moment, the relationship between Mr. Hooker and his friend uh, John Siegenthaler in the Kennedy administration was key in obtaining the cooperation of that uh, Justice Department in Baker versus Carr and the ultimate result that we celebrate today.